Atari cartridges, the best American poetry anthologies, Blu-rays, board games, cacti, cassettes, comic books, CDs, dice, dinosaur books, dinosaur toys, DVDs, encyclopedias of monsters, giants, dragons, and fairies, etc., fantasy miniatures, fossil shark's teeth, golden field guides, horror movie magazines, insects, Kanikumon figures, Lego, marbles, Marvel action figures, official handbooks of the Marvel Universe, poetry books, science fiction and fantasy paperbacks, seashells, socks, Star Wars toys, ticket stubs, VHS movies, video games, vinyl records, vintage Dungeons and Dragons books, world coins, and zoids. This is a partial catalog of things that I have collected in my life. <laughs> when I say collected, I mean found. Found on beaches and in secondhand shops. Found and kept and treasured. I've invested a significant amount of money just in materials to keep my collections in. So I guess you could also say I'm a collector of boxes and trays and jars and cases and archival bags and plastic sleeves. There's a joke amongst those of us who collect things that the difference between a hoarder and a collector is a matter of shelf space. I've been thinking and writing about my collections for long enough now to know that there's more to it than just space, and I'm not the only one. The German essayist and philosopher Walter Benjamin wrote in his essay, Unpacking My Library, that every passion borders on the chaotic, but the collector's passion borders on the chaos of memories. A passion a fervent love, an ecstatic emotion, a single-minded pursuit, but also don't forget, passion means suffering. So, for the collector, it's a proclivity that's equal parts, well, maybe not equal parts, but some pleasure and some pain. For Benjamin, who was a book collector, the love came from that friction between the overwhelming disorder of the collector's memory and the very satisfying order of the collector's shelf. The difference between an object being lost and knowing exactly where to find it when you want it. The pleasure of having the rare and meaningful close at hand and the pain just want to apologize to my wife here, of having to lug it around with you whenever you have to move. <laughs> Every passion borders on the chaotic, but the collector's passion borders on the chaos of memories. Now, don't get freaked out by that word chaos. We're talking about borders here. So a passion is almost completely and utterly out of order, but it doesn't quite get there. And when I think about the chaos of memories, I think more about predictability. How sometimes you just can't remember something important, like the name of the person whose hand you're shaking, or the password to your email, or where you left your damn keys. And sometimes memories will come to you almost unbidden, triggered by a smell or a, a certain slant of light. Collecting gives us a way to access those random memories purposefully through objects. Now, let me give you an example. Keep in mind, this isn't a story. It's not a cause and effect plot. There's no hidden meaning. Shout out to the English teachers. Okay, this is just a view from the border of the chaos of memories. This is a fossil shark's tooth. It's millions of years old. 
It comes from an extinct species of white shark called Carcharocles auriculatus. I found it on a beach in North Carolina maybe 35 years ago. When I hold this tooth in my hand, I can feel the hot sand of Topsail Island under my feet. I can see my friends, Peter and Ritus, Frankie, my brother John, walking way ahead of me on the beach. We had been coming back from the mini golf and arcade back to our rental beach cottage when I looked down and I saw this sitting on the sand just a few feet in front of me. I couldn't believe it. I picked it up. I actually cried out in excitement that I had found this enormous tooth, but over the roar of the surf and the Atlantic breeze, no one could hear me. I actually made a gesture at picking up the pace so I could show them what I'd found, but in case there were other teeth to be found, I slowed my roll. This is the freedom of summer. It's the bleeps and blurbs of the Galaga and ghosts and goblins and gauntlet arcade machines at the mini golf. It's my love for my friends. It's my childhood dream of becoming a paleontologist, a collector whose passion borders on the chaos of the memories of the earth itself, it seems to me. Now, I go back further. Another beach, another time. Mom shook me gently awake. It was barely dawn. The sky was still red above the Atlantic. Good morning, the tide's out, she whispered. And I rolled out of bed and joined her in the living room of our rental apartment. She had studied the tide tables for Myrtle Beach earlier in the week so she could figure out what the best morning for beachcombing would be. She wanted to get out before all those old ladies with their Wonder Bread bags could find all the great shells that had washed up overnight. So a quick brush of the teeth and we were out the door. And I walked along beside her, holding her hand, and she had her coffee, of course. And every time we found something, she would dig under it with her big toe and I would bend down to pick it up. We found lightning whelks and shark's eye moon snails and coquinas and olive shells. And one, just one, tiny chocolate-colored tide-worn fossil tooth. I haven't stopped combing beaches for these things in the 40 years since then. I found this Carcharocles tooth on a beach in 1987. I lost mom on Thanksgiving Day, 2019. This is another artifact, a slightly more nerdy one. This is the first fantasy miniature I ever painted. It's a hobbit on a pony, and it's made of lead. It has a limited color palette because the paints I used were from a paint-by-numbers kit that was meant to reveal a zebra on the savanna. <laughs> Hence, olive green, tan, yellow, black, and white. He was part of a set of figures that my brother had given to me for Christmas one year, and it was the first set of figures I'd ever owned, intended for use with Dungeons and & Dragons and other things. We'll get to that later. When I hold that figure in my hand, and I feel its weight, I can see my best friend, Ritus. We're sitting together at my dad's old office desk, which we had moved into my bedroom, so I could have a place to do all of my nerdy things. We're teaching ourselves how to paint these things, listening to Q107 on the radio. The song is With or Without You. I can see the dried flecks of paint on the surface of the desk and hear the way that office chair used to squeak. Another time and place, back at his house now, I can see he and I sitting with his older brother, Valdus, who in many ways was my older brother too. I can see us laying on Valdus's bedroom floor, listening to Stairway to Heaven on vinyl. And we're not allowed to talk because it's what Valdus called a sacred song. <laughs> I can see us 
sitting on the floor of his kitchen way after midnight, eating bowls of pasta that we had cooked ourselves with butter and salt. I can see us gathering around their enormous dining table, playing old school role-playing games, like this one, what old gamers like myself refer to as Blue Book Basic D&D. I used to pull a copy of Blue Book Basic from Valdis's bookshelf, study it like a textbook from school. Maybe it's because it says adult in the corner. Felt like it was up to no good. And I would memorize the names of monsters and medieval weapons. Holding it now, I can see myself standing on that thick blue rug in his bedroom, studying with absolute intent those line drawings of rust monsters and mind flayers, pole axes and morning stars. I found this copy of Blue Book Basic in a used bookshop in 1995. We lost Valdis in 2017, way too young to cancer. Ever since someone gave me a copy of She's So Unusual for my 11th birthday, I've been collecting music. I've probably sold or given away more music than most people have ever owned in the first place. But the record that I treasure most is one that I almost never listened to. It's this. This is the most terrifying thing I have ever heard <laughs> or seen. At least that's how I felt when I was eight or nine years old. Mom brought a copy of Ghostly Sounds home to be the soundtrack for our Halloween trick-or-treat party one year. We had a wire record rack that we kept all of our vinyl in on the floor of my dad's home office. And so whenever I would pass by the office on my way to bed, I would see that record because I kept it right on the front. And it scared me so badly. One night when I went to bed, I actually screamed in terror when it was time for lights out. I remember my father coming running into the room. What? What is it? And I told him that I was scared that this cartoon vampire with a top hat and bat, ear, bat wing ears was going to creep through my window. And he was utterly flabbergasted. I said, why, why don't you just move it to the back of the rack so you don't have to look at it anymore. <laughs> it was a very Bob thing to say. I couldn't look away, that's why. This is the first cool evening of autumn. It's the smell of wood fires and apple cider in the air. It's that thrill of the school Halloween parade and anticipation of the night when we could run amok in the neighborhood and demand candy from our neighbors. Even Mr. Cooper next door, who always gave out dimes or toothbrushes instead of candy. <laughs> I can see my dad waiting patiently at the end of each driveway while we ran from door to door, smoking and drinking bourbon with his friend Tommy, but patiently waiting as we gathered our hall and he only demanded a Snickers tax as a fee. He waited for us the same way he waited outside of Collector's World while John and I went in for our weekly pickup of X-Men and Alpha Flight. The same way he waited through endless, terrible, cheesy monster movies. The same way he waited while we screamed our way through Chuck E. Cheese's Pizza Time Theater and Arcade at our birthday parties in the same way that he waited for me to go to sleep when I was terrified of a purple vampire in the night. I found this copy of Ghostly Sounds on eBay in 2004. I lost dad a few days before my 47th birthday. So every passion borders on the chaotic, but the collector's passion borders on the chaos of memories. And the world, and our lives are always drifting towards chaos. Maybe 
I like to add to my collections, not just to feel the thrill of discovery, but the thrill of recovery. Maybe I add to my collections because when I find something that I want to keep, in some ways, it feels like I'm taking something back. In the back of my mind, though, it's still kind of tragic. All these things, eventually, will drift towards oblivion again, just like my memories will sooner or later. But when I can hold a tooth or a figure or a beat up old paperback, in some ways, I feel like just for a moment, I can recover anything or anyone I've ever lost.